uh, right here on VOA One The Hits. Hello, and welcome to Learning English, a daily 30 minute program from the Voice of America. I'm Ana Mateo. This program is for English learners, so we speak a bit slower. And our stories are written especially for people learning English. Schools in the United States are using a large increase in federal money to help students' mental health needs. School systems or districts are given plenty of freedom on how to spend the federal money. But mental health problems among students had become clear. Districts have observed a rise in behavioral issues, signs of stress, and absenteeism as students returned to classrooms this fall. For many, it was their first time back in a full classroom since the start of the COVID 19 pandemic. In Kansas City, Kansas, educators are opening an after school mental health center. The center is filled with counselors and social workers. Schools in Chicago, Illinois, have care teams with the mission of helping struggling students. For some school districts, the money has aided long standing work to help students deal with trauma, difficult experiences that have led to emotional problems. Other school systems have created new efforts to treat students. Overall, the money puts public schools at the center of efforts to improve students' general well being. When the government sent aid to schools after the 2008 economic recession, this conversation wasn't happening, said Amanda Fitzgerald. She is with the American School Counselor Association. Now, Fitzgerald said, the discussion across the country is very centered on student well being. Last month, three major children's health groups. Said the situation of children's mental health should be considered a national emergency. The U.S. Education Department has pointed to the aid money as a chance to rethink how schools provide mental health support. Education Secretary Miguel Cardona said mental health needs to be at the center of recovery from the pandemic. The pandemic aid to schools totals $190 billion. That is more than four times the amount the Education Department normally spends on kindergarten through 12th grade schools each year. Money for mental health services has gone toward worker training, mental health examinations, and classroom lessons that include social and emotional learning. Many districts have been working to hire more mental health experts. The National Association of School Psychologists questioned its members this fall. It found that more than half of districts were planning to add social workers, psychologists, or counselors. With $9.5 million of federal aid funding and outside grant money, Patterson Schools in New Jersey added five behavioral experts. The district also hired two substance abuse experts and workers able to identify students going through crises. Patterson is one of the poorest parts of New Jersey. Many of the 25,000 students there faced hunger even before the pandemic and struggled after family members lost jobs. Said Superintendent Eileen Schaefer. We wanted to make sure before we try to teach anything new that we're able to deal with where our children are right now based on what they've been through, she said. In Ellicottville, New York, school psychologist Joe Pryor is seeing more anxiety among students. He said the district wants to use the aid to hire a counselor to connect students with psychological help. Chicago, the nation's third largest school district, created a healing plan for students using $24 million of its $2.6 billion in federal aid. 
In Detroit, the district is spending $34 million on mental health programs. The school system is using the money to screen students, expand help from outside mental health providers, and offer extra support to parents. On a recent Wednesday, that meant an hour-long meditation session for parents at a local coffee shop. One parent worried her own stress was affecting her son's ability to learn. As a community, we have all been through something, said Charlonda Buckman, an assistant superintendent who took part in the session. Part of the recovery has to be some intentional work in spaces like this so we can be there for our kids. I'm Dan Novak. Thanks, Dan. And now, words and their stories from VOA Learning English. Today, we talk about dots and spots. Now, both dot and spot can be used as a verb or a noun. And both have several meanings and can be used several ways. Here is the most common definition of a dot. A small, perfectly round circle. A spot is a small part of something that from the main part. Recently, we learned on this program the idiom, a leopard never changes its spots. Now, spots on a leopard are not perfect circles. They are small areas on the animal that are a different color. If we said the leopard had dots, it would mean the animal was covered in perfect small circles. It would look as if it were wearing polka-dotted clothing. Clothing with polka dots are marked with little circles. But there is no such thing as polka spots. However, both words are used with on the, on the dot, and on the spot. But they mean totally different things. If you are on the dot, you arrive someplace at exactly the time you were expected to arrive. On the spot means right away. For example, if you are hired for a job on the spot, you are hired immediately. Spot can also mean a certain place. For example, many people remember the exact spot of their first kiss. That is, if it was a good one. X marks the spot means an exact place you want something or where something is to be found. You might see this on a treasure map. The X on the map marks the spot where the treasure is buried. So that definition is important to know. Sometimes the spot is in our bodies. For example, if something like food or drink hits the spot, it is much needed and comes at the perfect time. Other things can hit the spot. A warm room when you are cold, or a night out with friends when you have been unhappy, could both hit the spot. You needed them both. However, more often than not, we use hit the spot for food and drink. For example, if you have been walking in the desert, you might really need some water. In that case, a big drink of water would really hit the spot. And again, we do not say hit the dot. But we do say connect the dots. This means to understand something by piecing together little bits of information. You figure out something by connecting the dots. This expression comes from a children's activity called, not surprisingly, connect the dots. 
You draw lines connecting numbered dots, and a picture starts to appear. Finally, a dotted line is made up of very small dots. And when you sign on the dotted line, you officially agree to buy something or do something by signing a document. So read a document carefully before you sign on the dotted line. Now let's hear some of these expressions used. Since we already talked about treasure maps, let's stick with that situation. Two friends are out in the woods looking for a buried treasure. How long have we been walking in these woods? I don't know. Just keep walking. Well, how much further does the map say to go? We started up here near this hill. This map says the treasure is buried on the other side. So we have to keep walking. How do you know? Look at the map. X marks the spot. Right there. I think we passed that spot an hour ago. No, we didn't. We have to keep walking north. I am so thirsty. Then drink some water and stop complaining. Ah, that water really hit the spot. Don't drink all your water. We still have hours of walking to do. Hours? We told Jimmy we would be at the secret meeting spot at 10 p.m. on the dot. I did not agree to a specific time, so Jimmy is just going to have to wait. What if he leaves? You know, I don't care if Jimmy leaves. We're doing all the work out here. Walking in the woods, looking for a buried treasure. You know what I think? What? I think if we find the treasure, we should just keep walking. Keep it for ourselves. I don't know. If Jimmy goes back to the boss without us and without the treasure, I think he'll be able to connect those dots pretty quickly. And then we're dead. Good point. Man, why did we sign on the dotted line and agree to do this? There has got to be an easier way to make a buck. Yeah. Maybe we could open a bookstore or something. And that's all the time we have for this Words and Their Stories. Until next time, I'm Ana Mateo. Now, let's hear a story about space from Brian Lynn. American and European officials sharply criticized Russia's recent missile test that exploded an orbiting satellite into many pieces. Scientists said this orbiting debris will increase risks to humans and their efforts in space for years to come. But what is this debris? also called space junk, and what are the safety threats it presents? Space debris is anything humans have placed in space but no longer use. The junk floats around hundreds of kilometers above Earth. Experts say the main worry is that such debris will hit a space station, satellite, or other equipment. Space debris orbits around the Earth very fast, about 25,000 kilometers per hour in low Earth orbit. The junk could cause major damage if it hits satellites or spacecraft. 
every satellite that goes into orbit has the potential of becoming space debris, said Professor Hugh Lewis with Britain's University of Southampton. Lewis, who heads the university's astronautics research group, spoke to Reuters news agency. With the number of satellite deployments rising, near-Earth space will likely see more space debris in the coming years. Russia is not the only country to have destroyed a satellite. China, the United States, and India have also carried out anti-satellite missile tests. The U.S. government tracks about 23,000 pieces of debris larger than a softball orbiting the Earth. About 500,000 pieces of debris are larger than one centimeter and 100 million pieces are about one millimeter or larger. Holger Krog is head of the European Space Agency's Space Safety Program Office. He told Reuters that if the buildup of debris continues, some areas of space might become unusable. The satellite Russia just destroyed had been launched in 1982. It weighed more than 2,000 kilograms. American officials said the test created more than 1,500 pieces of trackable orbital debris. The U.S. Space Command said the missile strike likely created hundreds of thousands of additional smaller pieces of debris. Crew members aboard the International Space Station were directed to take shelter in their attached spaceship capsules for two hours after the test. The safety measure was taken in case the crew had to leave because of possible damage from debris. The American Space Agency, NASA, says debris in orbits 600 kilometers or less from Earth will fall back to the planet within several years. But space junk above 1,000 kilometers is expected to continue circling for a century or more. Japan's Aerospace Exploration Agency and the European Space Agency have partnered with private companies to find ways to remove space debris. In addition to being a threat to space property and astronauts, debris also increases the cost for satellite operators. Industry experts have estimated that protection and reduction efforts dealing with space junk make up about 5 to 10 percent of satellite mission costs. I Mario Ritter Jr. is up next with a story about Chile. Chilean citizens vote Sunday to choose a president. Seven people are competing for the country's top position. Public opinion studies show two candidates leading the race, Jose Antonio Cast and Gabriel Boric. Cast and Boric are widely considered to hold extreme political positions, Cast as a conservative, Boric as a liberal. The vote is the first presidential ballot in Chile since a civil uprising began in 2019 over economic inequality. Demonstrations as well as riots took place for months. Two years later, an effort to rewrite the country's constitution is in process. Chile has been a democracy for more than 30 years following the military dictatorship of General Augusto Pinochet. 
generally moderate political parties, have led the country. Chile has experienced so much economic growth that it is seen as the model to follow in South America. Political observers say the decision Sunday could shake that image. Nicholas Watson is a Latin American expert with the advisory business Teneo. He said the election represents the most important political shift since 1990. Public opinion studies suggest that neither Cast nor Boric will have enough votes to win the election. But they are expecting to win enough to face each other alone in a second part of voting. Both represent a new political generation outside the mainstream. Parties have long been considered center-left or center-right, meaning they propose moderate policies. Boric has said he wants to bury Chile's political model. Cast, who has praised Pinochet's economic policies, wants to reduce the size of the government and lower taxes. In Latin America, Chile stands out. World Bank measurements on the rule of law, regulation, governance, and political stability in Chile place it as stronger than its big neighbors, Brazil, Argentina, Colombia, and Peru. It is a member of the Organization for Economic Cooperation and Development, and considered a model of free trade. Its economic model is rooted in market policies of Western economists under Pinochet in the 1970s and 80s. It has been copied by others. They hope to reproduce Chile's stable economic growth. But critics of the model say that growth was not evenly spread. They say it created a few rich business leaders above normal Chileans. And they say Chileans have paid high costs for private health care and education and receive little retirement pay. I'm Mario Ritter, Jr. Thanks, Mario. Finally, let's hear from Gregory Stockel. Over the past four months, officials from two European countries, the European Parliament and the United States, have formed stronger relationships with Taiwan. Freddie Lim is a member of Taiwan Parliament's Foreign Relations Committee. He believes this is happening because countries can now openly talk with Taiwan. He added, Before, of course, all countries were having communication with Taiwan, but in the past it was all under the table. Under the table means the talks were unofficial. China sees self-ruled democratic Taiwan as a part of its territory. It has threatened force, if necessary, to bring the island under its rule. Taiwan has diplomatic recognition from just 15 small countries. Experts say Western countries' recent dealings serve as a warning to China, Taiwan's longtime political opponent. Lithuania agreed in July to permit Taiwan to set up a representative office. China recalled its ambassador to Lithuania, 
and warned of possible other effects. The Czech Republic's Senate president took a representative group of 89 leaders to Taiwan in August. The European Parliament decided to deepen economic and diplomatic relations with Taiwan last month. A report also raised concerns about China's use of its military to pressure Taiwan. Derek Grossman is a senior defense researcher with the U.S.-based RAND Corporation Research Organization. He said Western leaders have tired of China's authoritarian leanings. Grossman said that countries like Lithuania are joining together to reject the authoritarian model in international politics. Talking to Taiwan is one way to show that rejection. China usually does not oppose informal Taiwan foreign trade and some relations, but it does not like political or military exchanges. A spokesperson for Beijing's Taiwan Affairs Office said Monday, Taiwan's cooperation with other forces and continued independence fights were the root cause for bad relations. This included sending 700 Chinese airplanes into the Taiwanese Air Defense Identification Zone. Taiwan President Tsai Ing-wen has said during her five years in office so far that countries that share her democratic values should support her. I'm Gregory Stockel. Thanks, Gregory. And that is our show for today. Thank you for listening. Some content in this program was provided by the Associated Press or Reuters News Agency. And don't forget to join us again tomorrow to learn English through stories from around the world. I'm Ana Mateo.